Good afternoon, and thanks for joining Washington, D.C.-based Jennifer Shaftesman Associates in our Get Far Sighted in 2020 complimentary webinar series. As you know, the FAR or Federal Acquisition Regulations is the rulebook that the government, federal government must follow when making purchases. Our webinar series pulls from contract experts to explain each part of the FAR. It is complimentary and recorded. We post all the recordings on our website and YouTube channel, where we have over 300 government contracting webinars available for download. A special thanks to our webinar partner in the series, to the National Veterans Small Business Coalition Education Foundation. Please visit the website to learn more about the organization. We would also like to thank our friends at Open the FAR for their sponsorship. If your organization is interested in, is interested in sponsoring the series or one part, please contact hello at jenniferschouse.com. And now a little bit about us. We work with primarily large businesses to help them navigate the federal marketplace. We work with both product and service companies as well as software firms. Our clients span the globe and include public digital organizations in a variety of sectors. We provide market analysis reports, contract administration, contract vehicle assistance, and more. All of our services can also be built into a training course for your team. Learn more about us on our website. And now we would like to let you know about some ways to reach, reach the government and government contractors through us. We offer advertising and sponsorship opportunities through our weekly newsletter and also in our webinar series. For pricing or to place an order, please email us at hello at jennifershouse.com. Now let's move on to learn a bit about today's speaker, Susan Warshaw-Abner. You can find her uh, contact information on the screen here. And today we are covering FAR Part 34 with Susan. Thank you so much for joining us. We're really thankful for your participation in the series. The floor is now yours, and please let me know when you're ready for your next slide. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Susan Warsha Evner from Stinson LLC, and I'm here today to talk about FAR Part 34, Major System Acquisition. Next slide, please. We're gonna focus on four elements of the FAR rule. One, what is a major system? Two, acquisition of major system acquisitions. Uh, the use of Title III Defense Production Act and Earn Value Management Systems, which are part of FAR Part 34. As a sort of overview, FAR Part 34 is guided by OMB Circular A109 and A11 and FAR Part 7 acquisition plans. The policy for our major system acquisition is to promote innovation and full and open competition, to express agency needs and major system acquisition program objectives and then focus resources and any special management attentions needed in order to have effective competition and really ensure that a major system is developed that meets the needs of the government um, in a beneficial way. It is a formal acquisition planning process. It's a soup to nuts life cycle, which makes it different from co typical commercial item acquisition, streamlined acquisition, or other kinds of uh, GSA schedule, multiple award schedule things that you might be used to. Next slide, please. Um, so what is a major system? A major system basically could be any combination of elements that functioning together will produce the capabilities that will fulfill a mission need. It could be something as large as an entire F-35, which is the airplane on the left side of the screen, I mean F-15, which is the airplane on the left side of the screen, or it even could be a component of that system. It could be the radar system. It could be a navigation system. Um, the middle slide is a picture of the JDAM um, munition, and the thing that makes that different, that mission system piece, is that it's not a dumb uh, piece of uh, ammunition that you just drop, but rather it has guidance systems. And so having those kinds of things may make it a major system. It could be hardware, equipment, or software. On the right-hand side is a satellite, and that's just an example of it could even be a commercial service that's being provided. Um, all of these different things could be major systems. Uh, FAR Part 34 provides that system acquisitions normally designated as major are those programs that, as determined by the agency head, are directed at and critical to fulfilling an agency mission uh, to entail allocating relatively large resources for the particular agency, and three, that warrant special management attention, including specific agency head decisions. So there you have it. Uh, could be concept exploration, could be demonstration contracts, could be full-scale production and full production. Those all might be elements of a major system acquisition. Next slide, please. So uh, going back to that, if DOD is responsible, there is a difference between DOD major system acquisitions and other agency acquisitions. DOD has much higher levels of what will trigger a major system. Um, 
They could be, as I said before, it could be a research development or test or evaluation kind of contract. If it exceeds 185 million, uh, it might fall into that major system definition if the agency had determines it. Um, it also deals with major systems that in FY14 constant dollars could be at more than 835 million. So very large dollar values for DOD major systems. In contrast, civilian agencies, uh, if you have an estimated expenditure that's above $2 million or another dollar threshold set by the specific agency, that too could be considered a major system and trigger the requirements. So as we said, it's something that's determined based on the agency head, what is and isn't a major system. Next slide, please. Um, in doing a major system, as I said before, it's a soup to nuts life cycle type of acquisition. You have to develop an acquisition strategy and it's tailored to that particular major system program. Uh, one of the points that's really of note is at the Department of Defense, for example, uh, the DOD Directive 5001 and 5002, those uh, kind of lay out the whole framework for how you acquire a major system. And it goes everywhere from looking at what the contract type is based on program risk. If you're doing research and development, you know, you're kind of moving from potentially a cost, a cost type of contract where you don't know exactly what you're going to wind up with and you're doing research and development for a major system, or if you do know exactly what it is that you want to have as an end result, and you can pretty much identify what the fixed, you know, the research and development parameters are and what you're going to expect at the end. It may very well be a cost, not a cost contract, but a fixed price contract or one with an incentive fee. So major system acquisitions could run the gamut from cost to fixed price to fixed price incentive fee, uh, and they each have different complexity and challenges. Uh, the key in doing a major system acquisition is that you're always going to be documenting the basis for selection. Uh, as we said before, they want effective competition to the extent that the government can get economically beneficial and practicable competition. That's what they're looking for under a major acquisition major system. However, you could have a sole source as well, but that would have to really be documented. You'd have to probably show in the sole source that there was no other way of getting that major system product. Next slide, please. I wanted to provide you, this is from a DOD acquisition life cycle. You can see just how complex these major system acquisitions get. Uh, they start off at the beginning planning stages, everything from budgeting, uh, to time schedules, to what is the mission requirement that needs to be met, all the way through to the end of the life cycle, sustainment, operation and sustainment, and disposition. So this is a very complicated chart, a lot of different pieces of it, but this demonstrates the different phases for acquisition, starting from planning to research and development, to technology maturation, to engineering and manufacturing, to LREP, which is low rate initial production, full production, and then sustainment, and then end of life cycle. Very complicated. Next slide. But to kind of break it down into different pieces, here are some of the contracts that you might find under a major system acquisition. One could be concept exploration contracts. Those, as we said, deal with refining the proposed concept. They may be short term, kind of like proof of concept. Here's what we want to do. They may be prototype. They could be demonstrating con contracts where you're kind of demonstrating, you know, the full scale development of something and showing that it works. It could be full scale development contracts where you're pricing things not only for demonstration, but after demonstration, full scale production. Um, and then there could be production contracts where you've identified, created a major system, and now you're proceeding on uh, producing it. And during that process, you may have things like engineering change proposals and other things that need to get addressed. Uh, even during the full production process, there could be things that arise. And then in addition, even with a major system, you may be acquiring subsystem or component contracts. So. Uh, an item of supply that could be an individual part, a component, a sub-assembly, an actual assembly, a system, subsystem, uh, things that might have to be replaced during the life of the system. Uh, this could include spare parts and replenishment parts. Uh, it's not going to include packaging or labeling associated with the shipment. It's just going to 
involve those parts. Next phase, please. Okay, so as I said before, acquiring a major system requires the promotion of full and open competition as long as economically beneficial. It is a mission-oriented solicitation focusing on what the agency actually is going to need. And as with many other kinds of procurements, it's publicized through the what used to be called the Federal Biz Ops, Fed Biz Ops, FBO website, which is now located at www.beta.sam.gov. Um, as you remember, the SAM website has now been consolidated, so a number of the different websites that previously existed have been merged into Beta SAM. I don't know when it's going to become just SAM, but it is Beta SAM at this point, and so the FBO website is included in there. Next slide, please. So what are the steps for acquiring a major system? You know, that may start with the agency knows it has a mission, it knows what it wants to accomplish, but it doesn't quite know what it's going to need to do to get that. So they may start with what's called a broad agency announcement or request for information. They also may have a industry day. At the industry day, the agency may come out and say, here are what our mission goals are. These are the things that we want to achieve. Uh, they may have people talk about the programs and they may take questions from industry on uh, exactly what's being sought. Uh, there's an opportunity for questions and answers. And ultimately, the result of this kind of market survey industry uh, kind of exploration is uh, solicitation. Uh, typically, it could be a request for proposals. And that request for proposals um, may be sent out for full and open competition on the Beta SAM website we talked about. Uh, as with all kinds of far base procurements, uh, the solicitation will include not only a statement of work, uh, the intended contract line items, but also the uh, requirements for what's going to be included in the proposal and the stated evaluation criteria for evaluation and award. Uh, there could be protests of those procurements, both at the initial phase of what's in the request for proposal. You know, is it overly broad? Is it overly narrow? Uh, does it is it focused on a particular kind of solution, not accepting other solutions? Are there things that might be protested about the way it's going to evaluate or the things uh, that are going to make people eligible for award on down? <clears throat> in this regard, I mean, things such as the supply chain risk rule might be things that come up in a major system acquisition because, of course, the integrity of the supply chain becomes extremely important in a major system acquisition. And there could be protests at the end in terms of evaluation of uh, protested um, respondents to the solicitation or um, protests of the selection of particular entities. And then there are performance life cycle issues that also may arise in terms of how the procurement's going to be done uh, and whether it's going to be something where it's an initial R&D or an initial development of requirements and specifications or if it's going to be a combined requirements, specifications, production, um, and those sorts of things. So, you know, as you know from conflict of interest rules, you know, uh, entities that create specifications in one procurement may not be eligible for then bidding on the follow-on production. So in a major system, you might find that those things are all together in terms of here's what's going to be done to meet the requirements, and here's what's going to be done to deliver them or it could be broken up into different phases. Next slide. So testing qualification and use of industrial resources. So when you talk about a major system, we also talk about Title III. So particularly for defense and non-defense, in fact, I, we see this in the COVID uh, uh, situation right now where they're using Title III, the Defense Production Act, in order to develop and then procure um, products and services to address everything from, you know, health issues to getting PPE. So we're seeing this in a very broad way right now. But the Defense Production Act is used to ensure that uh, we're using a domestic industrial base to the extent we can to obtain supplies and services needed for the national defense. So when we talk about Title III, what's an industrial resource? It could be material, it could be services, it could be processes, it could be equipment. Um, 
It could include, you know, all manner of things needed. Those each could be whatever is needed in order to do the major system acquisition. Uh, those could potentially be tagged as industrial resources. Next slide. So one of the things about uh, part 34 is it talks about uh, policies and procedures for testing qualification and use of these industrial resources that we've identified. And uh, so government assistance could be used in order to facilitate that. So for example, a Title III might be used for a technology investment agreement where the government is going to assist in the construction of a facility in order to carry out the manufacture of necessary components or systems in a major system. Or we could see it in other kinds of aspects in terms of you know, cooperative agreements or uh, assistance in getting a title, title uh, three kinds of assistance where, for example, rated orders. Uh, and I think that's on the next slide. So let's go to the next slide. So what is a title three project contractor? It's an, a contractor that receives some form of assistance or is designated as being covered by Title III. Um, the contracting officer you know, may put in a whole host of things in order to address a Title III requirement. Under the 52234-1 clause, industrial resources developed under Title III Defense Production Act, uh, this provides that um, in Title III industrial resources will include materials, services, processes, or equipment. Uh, in order to uh, provide assistance for the manufacture of a Title III major system product. Uh, to the extent we talked about rated orders, uh, that might be something particularly in Title III that's used for a major system. A rated order is one where it gets a designation. If you look at the cover page for your contract, you'll see on the top it'll have rating, and it could indicate, for example, a DO or DX rating. That indicates a priority in the order. If you have a rated order, a rated order has to be satisfied before any other lower rated orders. And in addition, if you do commercial contracting or unrated orders, a rated order will take priority over any of those as well. It's really critical when you talk about rated orders that you address the issue of, do you actually produce the item that is being called for under the rated order if you're a manufacturer or supplier? And two, um, will you be able to deliver uh, the product or service that's being called for under the rated order in time to meet the schedule that's set in the rated order? If either of those things pose challenges, uh, you only have a limited amount of time in, in which to push back on the rated order and either uh, seek to reject it or to request an alternate schedule. And even if you reject it, uh, typically the only reason that you can reject a rated order is that you no longer produce the product. If you have the product, but you um, don't have sufficient quantities, that's something to advise them of and uh, seek to get the order adjusted or to figure out a schedule that will allow you to meet the rated order requirements. The other piece of a rated order is if you have a subcontractor, you are required to flow down that rated order. Uh, I would advise you if you get those kinds of issues and you have problems with subcontractors not wanting to accept rated orders, this is something you really want to coordinate with the government contracting officer on because if you do not meet a rated order requirement, that could eventually lead to problems for you as a prime contractor. So having a rated order, knowing what it means, whether you're a prime or a subcontractor and complying with it is going to be critical in this area. Next slide. Okay, thanks. So <clears throat> in terms of requiring major systems acquisitions, you know, we talk about OMB Circular A11. I don't know, I wish I could see you guys to see whether or not uh, you actually um, have ever looked at OMB Circular A11. It is quite a hefty tome that's like very big. And the A11 uh, circular covers everything from scoring in terms of, you know, how does this, this uh, project work? How much money is involved? What are the needs? There are budget scoring things that have to be considered. And then to what kind of dollars are gonna be needed? Uh, what's the budget breakdown? You know, when you talk about colors of money, you know, you talk about 
uh, under the Anti-Deficiency Act, for example, you cannot use money except for the purposes, time, and schedule that the money is available for. So this OMB circular gives, gives the layout for, you know, how do you track this in a major system acquisition? And so for earned value management, this becomes a key element because earned value management is this whole process of tracking the evolution and development and, and production of a major system in terms of how much is this going to cost? What is my expectation for how this is going to cost? During the life cycle, are there things that are going to impact the cost? Because when you have a major system, you're always thinking about, we need to accomplish the mission. And so you have much more granular management of a major system than you would of other systems. And that's why EVMS, Earned Value Management, is used in those kinds of major systems. There are tools that the government uses to track a contractor's progress. Uh, we call them a gold card. It's sort of like the layout of, do are, the, are you meeting your estimate to complete? Are you on schedule? Are you on budget? And those are the kinds of things that they look for in a gold card. Um, when you have a solicitation where EVMS is going to be required, there will be provisions in there and you should look at them uh, to see what the EVMS provisions are and to see if there's any opportunity. You may have other things in there such as earn value management, and you may have incentive fee. So there may be other provisions that you also want to look at. Even if it's not a major system, you may still find that you have an EVMS clause in your contract for particularly large or complex procurements. So it really pays for you to know and look at that. Let's go to the next slide. Thank you. So this is like a sample of an EVMS gold card that the government looks at. So as you can see, it's got the BCWS, the budgeted cost for work schedule, meaning here's what we plan to have this thing do. This is the schedule for how it's going to work. This is how much money is going to be needed at each of the milestones in that schedule. And then we sort of have this other line, which is the EAC, which is the estimated cost to complete. And that line may change over time depending upon the experience in the performance of the contract. So if there are schedule delays, if there are cost variances, you'll see that line moving so that the EAC may move. This is something as a contractor you really want to be watching and as a government official as well, because at the end of the day, if you have a cost reimbursement contract, uh, you want to make sure that if there isn't enough money that's on the contract, that that's being addressed early. If you have a fixed price contract and you see that you might be estimating to cost more money at the end, the question is, are there any bases for seeking changes or getting that EAC uh, you know, change reflected in your contract so that you have funding for it? So these are pieces that as a contractor, even if you don't have an EVMS contract, you wanna have those kinds of estimate to complete, what is my initial budget, how am I doing during the life cycle of the procurement to track it and make sure that you're on time and on schedule? Next slide. So DOD, the application of uh, EVMS cost or incentive contracts and subcontracts less than 20 million. As I said before, in uh, the DOD space, that's optional. Uh, it depends on whether or not they believe this is sufficiently complex. Uh, or it requires enough attention that it's an important program, even if it's not a major system, and they want to use EVMAs as a way to minimize the risks and really have more effective tracking. So when you talk about an EVMS system, you know, the cost or incentive contracts or subcontracts greater than 20 million, they have to comply with the ANSI EA. EIA 748 guidelines. Those are American National Standards Institute Electronic Industries Alliance standards for EVMS. Uh, DOD formally adopted that in 1998 for application to major defense acquisition programs. Um, notably, it's a copyrighted standard, so you have to get a copy of it from ANSI. Um, there are two portions of it that are main guides. One is the Systems Acceptance Guide. That defines the process for an EVMS system owner or government program to comply with the guidelines for EVMS. And then the second is the intent guide, which defines the management value and intent needed for 32 guidelines. Among the 32 guidelines, there's a whole host of them, uh, but you can probably guess as to what they look at for an EVMS. 
those things would include defining the authorized work, which of course, whenever you do a government contract, you always want to create this kind of box. This is like what I tell a lot of my clients, look at the box, what goes in the box, what's required for the program, you know, what's the cost, what's the schedule, what's the technical stuff you need, what are the equipment pieces you need, what supplies do you need, what subcontractors do you need, are there any special things you have to account for, and then what's outside of the box. If things are outside the box, they're not required under the contract, so that if there are changes, you want to really know how has that changed. So defining the authorized work, um, in EVMS, you may find you get very granular. You deal with integrated work breakdown structures, which break down the work into, you know, subsystems and subsets so that it's sort of, you know, how many, how many uh, bites does it take to eat an elephant? And you start one bite at a time, but knowing granularly what your requirements are, it makes it easier to get those one bite at a time to meet the milestones that you need. So in a major system, you may see a lot of these separate you know, subsets that have their own subsets and their own work breakdown structures. And that way you're tracking where has the impact been? Where has a change occurred? Uh, it's really important in one of these major systems that you're really tracking and tracing your exact needs. It also might include sequential scheduling of work. You know, you've probably seen these huge Gantt charts that uh, in manufacturing and, you know, now they have them, of course, online, which makes it so much easier. But in the old days, we would have these giant charts and they would all be broken down based on, you know, that schedule of when are things supposed to occur, what's supposed to occur, what resources are needed, etc. cetera. Uh, it's also a time phase budget. So it's when will we need the money? Uh, it's going to be program targets in terms of what's my cost goal versus what are my internal budget items. It's going to require, uh, EVMS requires recording direct costs using a proper accounting system. So if you get involved in a major system, you want to make sure that you have a sufficient accounting system to handle this. That kind of thing may need uh, creating line items, you know, setting up numbers so that for the different charges, they go to the right place. So you can track them to see, are they hitting the WBS, the work breakdown structure components in the right way, or are you having changes? That's also going to facilitate later on if there is a change that you know exactly where the changes have occurred. If you don't do that kind of granularity, it may make it different, difficult, especially in a complex system. The other thing it's going to be asking for are identifying unit costs um, or lot costs. It's going to look for material cost accumulation by control accounts. Again, it's that work breakdown structure, very granular. And then, um, you know, just procurement changes, where are those changes? So those are some of the things that you need to focus on when you do EVMS. Next slide, please. Integrated baseline reviews. So where you have an EVMS requirement, the government will work with the contractor and conduct an integrated baseline review. I think that really helps both parties verify the technical content and the realism of the projected performance and budgets uh, and resources and schedule. It's supposed to be a mutual understanding of the inherent risks as well. And so having an IBR enables um, both parties, government and the contractor, to kind of look at, here's the schedule of what's supposed to happen. Remember, I talked about that box. Here's that box of what's supposed to happen so that you can identify potential risk areas ahead of time and address those as well. Uh, it's also going to talk about um, whether the performance measurements for the baseline are appropriate. I mean, one of the things we're dealing with now in this COVID environment are, you know, contractors who have uh, deliverables that, you know, are far off and with all the impacts of and delays of things that have been happening, the question is, are you getting those milestone payments that you need to keep proceeding? You know, are you able to get paid? And so having this kind of granular integrated baseline and understanding you know, the right way of focusing on attaining the cost objectives, managing the process may then uh, help identify areas where you might have additional needs that need to get addressed. Um, an IBR may be sought pre-solicitation. Um, you know, whatever happens pre-solicitation, I think it's always most essential that 
once you get the contract, there's a meeting of the minds where government and industry sit down and you have this meeting to ensure that you all have the same baseline. So even if something occurs previously, you wanna make sure that during the contract, you are addressing that integrated baseline, doing that review. Next. These are some of the EVMS clauses, just for you to look out. As you can see, there are FAR EVMS clauses and there are deep FAR EVMS clauses. There are similar, slight differences, but knowing what clauses you have in your contract, uh, you need to go and look and see what it is that uh, you need to worry about for the particular contract. Next slide. Um, acquisition, as I said before, we talked about, for example, satellite services, acquisition of major weapon systems as commercial items. So what is a commercial item that becomes a major system? Uh, it could be something that is used for purposes other than governmental purposes that's customarily available for purchase in the marketplace. It could also include modifications, uh, but knowing that there are gonna be modifications, you really have to kind of balance, is the modification gonna be so great that it may render what you have not a commercial item? Where it is a commercial item, you have much more expedited kind of purchasing, uh, even though it is a major system. Uh, the Secretary of Defense or his designee, her designee, will determine if a system is a commercial item. Um, you know, and the commercial item definition, of course, is in FAR 2.101. But in addition, if you're talking about DOD, DOD has its own commercial item plan. Next slide. So if you look at the bottom, in fact, I've got a reference there to the Department of Defense guidebook for acquiring commercial items. Um, they have a part A, which makes commercial item determination. A couple of years ago, they actually required that for DOD acquisitions that they go through a commercial item determination and to ensure repeatability. Once you've gone through a DOD uh, determination, a formal determination that you have a commercial item, you actually can use that in other DOD procurements to say this is a commercial item. If you haven't gone through that process, it's something that you may have to go through. Um, there was talk about having commercial item determinations at other agencies. Could they be used for DOD? And the answer is at this point, DOD really is the one that's doing their own commercial item acquisition determinations. Um, other agencies do their commercial item determinations, but if DOD has decided that an item is a commercial item uh, for DOD, then um, that can carry forward throughout the DOD process. <clears throat> and other agencies may also give it some full faith and credit. So as I said before, major systems, subsystems or components or even spare parts may be treated as a commercial item. And if they are, then they are required on much more streamlined processes. Next slide. So at the end of the day, major systems are not simple and they may not be quick. Um, and they're gonna involve a lot of different personnel and programs. Uh, it's not just, okay, here, sell me this thing, but there really is gonna be a lot of thought into the acquisition, both at the agency level when they first start out to make a determination as to whether or not you have a major system on through the process of, you know, uh, any research and development that might be needed, any proof of concepts that might be needed, uh, acceptance and testing, uh, any special kinds of supply requirements that are needed uh, to, you know, the facilities that are used, the equipment that is used, getting it qualified, you know, particularly that's something we didn't talk about, but uh, major systems, for example, may result in an established bill of materials. The bill of materials will be based on um, accepted and qualified parts. And so when you produce the ultimate major system product, you need to follow the bill of materials and use the accepted and approved parts. If a part changes, that could entail having to retest and rethink um, and get approval for a new or different product. And that's part of the process. And where you have that, that may be very well something that where there is an unavailability that arises in getting a part that the government will have to approve that new part and there may be a cost share or government payment for that new testing process. 
Uh, but the issue also may be that if you have one of these major systems, that you need to ensure that you're creating a production line where you have sufficient um, inventory in order to perform the contracts that you have. So as we said before, Title III becomes very important in terms of ensuring that you have those products and facilities that you need in order to do the major system production that needs to get done. A lot of moving parts in a major system, but knowing the system, knowing how it works uh, can only help you kind of get to the right answer. So with that, that's an overview of major systems. Uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me, uh, susan.ebner at stinson.com, happy to talk and um, good luck. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Susan, for, for your presentation. Really appreciate your time and to our audience members for joining us. Really thank you for your participation in the series. And if you have any questions about federal contracting or need assistance to any of our services, please contact us directly. Thank you again for joining us. This concludes today's webinar. Have a great day.